Coming up on DTNS, smartwatch sales are booming. Zoom plugs its security holes by buying Keybase and how tech companies, big and small, will change forever. But how? This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, April 7th, 2020 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. From Oakland, California, I'm Justin Robert Young. And I'm Roger Chang from L.A. County. We were, uh, you're also the show's producer. Uh, oh, we were just talking about oranges. <laughs> uh, so many things about oranges. You would not believe oranges. the things we talked about oranges on Good Day Internet. Become a member and find out at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Google Lens has a new copy-paste feature that lets you save text from paper documents to your phone and other devices signed in on Chrome. You can also hear pronunciations of words by pointing your camera at them and select words to learn more about. AMD announced the Ryzen Pro 4000 series of mobile business processors. Those are the ones that compete with Intel's vPro line, built on the 7 nanometer Zen 2 architecture, including a dedicated AMD secure processor. That's the kind of thing that helps prevent kernel-level attacks. AMD's memory guard encryption feature to support full memory encryption, so they can't steal your laptop and read out the memory. The Ryzen 4000 series also includes AMD's Pro manageability with support for Microsoft's Endpoint Manager, Business Laptop, Tops with the chips will arrive later this year uh, from Lenovo and probably others. The Financial Times sources say that the UK is, playing, is paying Swiss IT company Zulke Engineering to investigate whether it can integrate with the decentralized Apple Google exposure notification system. After all, the UK is testing its own centralized system in the Isle of Wight. One of the advantages of the Google Apple system is that it keeps data on the device. The latest beta of iOS 13.5 includes an option to let users delete information collected by the exposure notification system. Now, India's coronavirus contact tracing app is already out and has become the fastest app to reach 50 million downloads ever, beating Pokemon Go. India is very proud of that right now. The prime minister encouraged the downloads. That helped, you know, right there from the bully pulpit. Uh, the app is technically voluntary for citizens, but also not. Government employees are required to use it, and many private employers and even landlords are requiring it as well. So it's essentially mandatory uh, in effect. The app tracks Bluetooth contact events and location, shows an infection risk badge, and offers access to telemedicine, pharmacy, and diagnostic services. So it's kind of a super app, not just a contact tracing app. The app is whitelisted so that it doesn't count against data caps on the telco providers in India. And also, sadly, does not have a privacy policy or an applicable <laughs> privacy law to limit its use. Probably still more functional than Pokemon Go. Possibly. Google updated its Authenticator app on Android to now feature Material Design 2.0 layout and adds an, import, an import-export tool. Users can select which accounts to export, which will generate a QR code to scan on a new device for import. The update also disables screen captures when displaying secure data. Mm, this has been needed for a long time. Very good. LG launched that mid-range 6.8-inch Velvet smartphone. That's the one with the full HD plus OLED display, 20.59 aspect ratio, back camera with the raindrop arrangement, a stylus in-display fingerprint reader, and a headphone jack. If you want it, fly to Korea. The device costs 899,800 <laughs> uh, won. Uh, it's about $730 in US dollars. It'll launch on all major carriers in Korea. Uber is leading a $170 million investment round in Lime scooters, along with Bain Capital and Alphabet's GV. Uber is also giving its own scooter operation jump to Lime, which plans to integrate it into the Lime app. And in local news, Lime is back in Oakland. Oh, congratulations. We'll have a little more on Uber's earnings a bit later. Uh, Liberty Global and Telefonica announced the company's plan to merge the UK's Virgin Media and O2 into a 50-50 owned joint venture. They were talking a lot about this on text message on Sunday, if you want to get the UK perspective on that. Existing Virgin Media mobile customers, which currently run on Vodafone's network, will be moved over to Telefonica, and the merger needs UK regulatory approval before it can happen. All right, let's talk about that Zoom key base thing. Zoom has acquired Keybase, which makes secure file sharing and collaboration tools. 
As soon as Keybase is incorporated, Zoom will offer end-to-end -end encrypted mode for all paid accounts. Keybase will become a subsidiary of Zoom, and Keybase's co-founder, Max Crone, will lead Zoom's security engineering team. According to CEO Eric Yon, Zoom will work with Keybase to determine the fate of all of its existing products. Keybase makes a key directory and maps social media identities to encryption keys for identity verification. In other Zoom news, the New York City Department of Education announced that schools are now allowed to use Zoom for online learning through a central New York City Department of Education Zoom account with stronger encryption and storage defaults. All right, I'm going to give you three takes on this story, Justin. Go. Ready? Go. First yeah. take is the Zoom take. Hey, look at us. The second take is the, <laughs> uh, the middle take, which is like, all right, Zoom, uh, convincing the New York City Department of Education with all the good changes you've been making, uh, buying some really smart people who really know encryption really well. Well done. I think this is a good sign. And the third take is, what are you doing? Why are you ruining Keybase? Stop. It shows that we have at least gotten used to uh, of packing in for this uh, horrifying plague that there is at least some section of society that is complaining about Keybase uh, becoming a different <laughs> thing. Because that is a very before times kind of attitude to say, no, you're ruining my favorite thing, as if it matters now that we look at what the world has become. That being said, Zoom, look, this was a, if you build it, they will, they will come thing for Zoom. They built a product that the world needed and they didn't realize uh, that it was their turn to get the hot spotlight until it hit them. I think it's inspired for them to say, look, uh, we're going to spend, we're going to assume that Zoom is going to be a part of society for a very long time. And that means it needs to be as secure as possible. Let's go to a company that has not only a good reputation, but a good track record in this and say, yeah, congratulations. Keybase now decides everything when it comes to Zoom security uh, from, from the products on down. I think yeah. it's inspired. Good job for Zoom. That's the, from, from if you're a Zoom user looking out, you see this as nothing but positive. Like, oh my gosh, thank goodness you've been making some good changes, and now you've got some of the smartest people on encryption in your team. What could be better? But if you're a key-based user looking in, you're very disconcerted, even if you're not just knee-jerk outrage by key by Zoom saying we'll work with Keybase to determine the fate of its existing products. Also, the guy who runs Keybase is going to run all of Zoom security. That's, those aren't positive sounding things for the existing Keybase user, unfortunately. It put, puts me in mind of when United bought Continental, and I loved Continental, and I despised United. And I despised United less after they bought Continental because the good things from Continental sort of infected United, but then it never was as good as Continental. Well, there we go. <laughs> Remember the Continental. Strategy Analytics estimates smartwatch shipments grew 20% on the year in Q1 to 13.7 million units. Apple has 55% of that market, rising 23% to 6.2 million. Samsung is in second with 14% of the market. They rose 11% to 1.9 million. And Garmin jumped back up to number three for the first time in two years. They have 8% market share, shipping 1.1 million units. That's up 38%. Strategy Analytics does expect a slowdown in Q2. Uh, because we are in the middle of the lockdown, you know, through Q2, but predicts a recovery in the second half as people want smartwatches for health monitoring. Oh, so long ago did I say that the Apple Watch was going to be Tim Cook's first big legacy product. Mm -hmm. And I think much like Zoom, a smartwatch is a pretty good place to be for a company like Apple or any of the others that we just mentioned. Uh, it's cheaper than a phone. It enhances the technology that already comes with, with your phone or operates independently. And it turns out that health monitoring is something that people are going to want more and more going forward. It's not just for calorie counters anymore, kids. Now, uh, uh, the, the things that used to be, well, let me get it for dad because he has a heart problem. Uh, now, everybody is going to be a little bit more in tune to find out what their pulse is. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a really good point. It's gone from like, well, I guess if you're into fitness or have health concerns to everyone. Yeah. Nintendo reports that it sold 3.29 million Switch consoles last quarter, up 33% on the year. 
Lifetime sales of the consoles are now at 55.7 million units, which Nintendo says is more than the lifetime sales of the Nintendo 64 and GameCube combined. The company also said that Animal Crossing New Horizons surpassed 11.77 million in sales in the quarter. But what next? Once villagers have a five-star island and have mo finished modifying it to look like Los Angeles and Blade Runner, what will they play next on their newly obtained Switch? There are some updates and expansions to Super Smash Brothers coming, but the slate otherwise is empty. The next Zelda follow-up is categorized as to be announced, and Nintendo said Thursday that it uh, it sees a fall software sales this financial year to 140 million units, even with Animal Crossing surge. Yeah, when Nintendo itself is like, look, we're very happy about the Animal Crossing thing, but we're still going to retell investors, don't expect us to have a rise in sales. Uh, and and they have record digital download sales right now because yeah. people don't want to go out to the store to pick up the the package. Uh, the the physical media people, of course, are ordering them to be delivered. But anybody who doesn't have a, a stake in that game is like, well, I'll just buy it here. I'm sitting here on my couch. I'm going to buy it right now. And yet they're expecting 140 million unit fall. It's probably the same thing that is delayed The Last of Us 2 uh, that has caused a lot of other delays because even as we find so many productivity enhancements from people working from home, it seems that video game development can't quite yet get up to the same speed that it does when everyone's in the same room. And that's affecting Nintendo as well, apparently. Uh, I was going to say that, uh, you know, Nintendo has uh, weathered uh, worse predicaments. And I think, you know, it, it's one of those things where uh, they're setting expectations. So people don't, especially uh, anyone who might be looking at uh, Nintendo's investment, uh, might not be, be jumping the gun and assuming that, you know, it's plummeting off a cliff. Uh, but, I mean, Nintendo has a history of managing... You know, even even from poor console sales to to poor game sales, I mean, they've managed through. I mean, they have a huge amount of money uh, that they sit on, and uh, you know, when when times are tough, they know as a company how to kind of you know uh, pull back on spending. Well, and and I am I am not going to pretend that I am a video game expert, but my sense of Nintendo's corporate culture is that slow and steady wins the race. They understand that their value is in novel hardware design, which they have shown, you know, with uh, uh, differing levels of success, but they have a hit here with the Switch and their IP. They don't want to devalue their IP. They they very rarely want to put out games that that might make people think less of Mario, Luigi, Link, and uh, uh, the Animal Crossing gang. So the fact that they don't have a lot of stuff coming out here now is not all that shocking. This is fairly deep into the life cycle of, of, of the Switch when they front load all their IP to come out. We've already gotten the Mario Kart and the Smash Brothers and the, and the Zelda game and the Mario game, and now Animal Crossing was kind of at the end of that. So I think for them, this is a, a bonus. This is a, a found money at, at, at the end of their big rollout of the IP that people expected. Yeah, or, or, or in a very important found money to balance out an unforeseen delay in other IP. Uh, sure. So, so on on the one hand, yes, they've got a huge income from Animal Crossing uh, sales. On the other hand, they aren't going to get the huge income from titles that they might have expected to put out earlier. I mean, having nothing on the roadmap right now is unusual, even for Nintendo. But this is one of those those stories where it's like, if you're a Nintendo fan person who just wants to trumpet Nintendo, well, there's a caveat, which is like, yeah. it's good news right now, but it might not be good news all year long. And if you're a Nintendo basher or or somebody who just wants to be outraged and say, ah, they're gonna, yeah, they're they're headed for the cliff. Well, it's Nintendo. They're they're not gonna be go out of business because of this. It's it's no. just a a moderating effect. In fact, what this will end up being is Nintendo this year might just look okay, like 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 you would have expected them otherwise. Microsoft announced an optimized for Xbox Series X badge. Xbox Series X is the name of the next console, if you haven't uh, been following that. Uh, yeah, they just keep adding words to each generation. Uh, optimized for Xbox Series X is a badge that games can put on their games to indicate they are designed to run on the forthcoming console. Optimized games take advantage of 4K, 
120 frames per second hardware acceleration, uh, hardware accelerated ray tracing, direct storage, and faster load time. That's a big one. Direct storage uses hardware compression to take some of the I.O. load off the CPU, like big assets that are part of open world games that can come off the storage, leaving the CPU to do a bunch of this other work that they want it to do uh, on physics and, and things like that. So uh, this, you know, this is a way for you to tell when you're buying a game and you have an Xbox Series X sometime in the future, oh, this one's going to take the best advantage of the hardware I have. And I will also say this is sort of a backhanded way to uh, to kind of shame developers that don't take advantage of certain hardware hooks in their hardware when they do cross-platform titles, right? Oftentimes you'll hear gamers complain of quote-unquote lazy ports that don't take advantage of the full system that they own that they bought the game for, and it looks just like the game on the, you know, the competitor system. And uh, they, I think it, part of it is the idea is that you, they want owners to feel special, and if owners feel special, then they have expectations that the stuff they buy is special. Yeah. So the, the badge is kind of uh, their way to kind of sort of uh, push, push that. It's the carrot, not the stick approach. Uh, they're, they're not actually shaming the developers, no. uh, except in absentia, to say like, well, you don't have that badge yeah, on there. So, exactly. You know, yeah. Uh, and, and, and it's something to, to promote, to say, hey, folks, when you're shopping for your Xbox games, look for the <laughs> optimized for Xbox Series X badge to know you're getting all the Ks and frames. Well, uh, you know, especially with the newer games that are going to be coming out that are 4K, I mean, you're dealing with an exponential amount more of data that needs to be pushed mm -hmm. through the system and onto your screen. And, you know, just managing that user experience so you're not sitting... I I, I've, I play 1080p games on a, on my PC, and the, some of the load times are unbearable, even if even though all the games in my system run off an SSD. They're still, I'm still waiting like 30 to 40 seconds, which might not seem like a long time, but... In some cases, it feels like forever, and I think yeah. they really just want to move that along. This is also a, uh, another fee that Microsoft could charge, too, right? Like, to get the badge. Oh, you mean like Adobe? Oh, not yeah. Adobe. Uh, what's I the... don't know. That is a good question. Uh, is this something that a developer has to pay extra to get? Or, or I and, and this is what I think it is, this is a reward for doing the development work. This is an encouragement to say, hey, folks, if you put in all this extra work to take advantage of these hooks, instead of just making your game across both the old Xbox One and, and this one, uh, it will let you use this badge. I, I think it might not require any more extra income. It mm. may just be a way to say, like, here's here's a little perk you're going to get if you My, do this extra yeah. development. My guess is is that them putting the PR behind it is part of the reason why you would want to put, you know, even if it's a nominal fee, you know, something, something behind mm -hmm. it. Uh, Tom, I got a feeling that Will I Am's company Wink will be asking, "Where's the love?" Where's the love? The smart home company gave users a week's notice that starting on May 13th, the company will charge four dollars and ninety nine cents monthly to retain access to Wink devices from its smartphone app with voice control uh, or over API integrations. Device owners without a subscription will have automations disabled disabled after that date. Boom, boom, pow. Wink says that the change in policy is a result of long-term costs and recent economic events, adding that the company doesn't offset costs by selling user data. My hubs, Tom. What a kerfuffle. <laughs> you just threw that last one in. That didn't even, didn't even make sense. Uh, so, yeah, this is... Uh, this is a company that is say, is trying. They're trying to say, "Hey, folks, we have yeah. been really good at not like mining you for data, but because of that, we have no money. So we're going to start <laughs> charging you in a week. I hope you understand." And that's a tough one. I mean, if they were giving thirty days notice, et cetera, uh, I think you'd you'd see a little little less consternation here. But but at any point, when you change something that's been free for the life of a of a device. Uh, to charge, this is what people are afraid of. And this actually doesn't happen that often. People are always no. saying like, well, it's free for now, but how long will that last? Usually it it lasts. This is one of those exceptional circumstances where the fear was realized like, aha, see, they started charging for it. And they're not giving, they're not grandfathering you in. It's basically, no. if you're there, you have to pay or you don't get access to your routines. Now, the one thing they are doing is they're storing the routines. So if you don't pay 
and the routines go away, and then later you start paying, your routines won't be deleted. They're keeping everything in the cloud. You just will lose access to it until you start paying the subscription fee. Yeah, we're going to talk a lot in a few minutes about the uncertain financial roadmap for a lot of these companies, but this is an example of what happens when maybe one that isn't super well run all of a sudden finds out that the balance sheet isn't what they thought, that the bad news is worse than they thought, and now all of a sudden they got to figure out where to get money, and uh, it turns out that their response, Tom, has been very 2000 and late. Yeah, it's... Uh... When you're asking people to, to just start paying $4.99 a month, it's hard to get it started. Uh, <laughs> to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, please subscribe to dailytechheadlines.com. Uber posted a $2.9 billion loss, riding down $2.1 billion in pre-tax losses from minority investments. This is them getting ahead of things, though. Uber had originally promised to be profitable this quarter, but they withdrew that guidance April 16th, once it became very clear what's going on in this world. Revenue from restaurant food deliveries did rise by more than 11% on a quarterly basis, but that's not nearly enough. Lyft, on the other hand, reported a surprise 23% jump in revenue, and said that its strict cost-cutting measures ensured it remained on a path to profitability. So they were able to save the quarter, even with a bad march, uh, and assure investors that they're in good shape, that their deliveries of other things are going to keep them through the slowdown in deliveries of people. Speaking of deliveries, though, not all delivery companies are in the same boat. Deliv, D-E-L-I-V, which delivers groceries, pharmaceuticals, and more, for big companies like Best Buy, Walgreens, and Macy's, is going to shut down in August. Deliv is going to transfer its delivery services to other providers and then sell off its technology assets to Target. So we're seeing three different companies engaged in a business that, with grocery delivery of food delivery, you think would be good, or with ride-hailing you think would be bad, having not the reactions you would expect. But it's not just these kinds of companies, the smaller companies or the niche companies, Alphabet's Sidewalk Labs has pulled out of a smart city project in Toronto because of economic uncertainty. Sidewalk Labs had worked for years with the Toronto government on a plan to test using sensors to collect data and help manage a 12-acre city development in Toronto's business district. A vote to finally get that approval of its proposal was scheduled for June. There'd been a lot of work on this, a lot of fighting about whether they should do it and how they should do it. And they just pulled the rug out from under it. Sidewalk Labs first got permission to develop this proposal in October 2017, submitted its master plan last June. But when you are basically getting your money from a company that makes all its money from a company called Google that makes all its money on advertising, and that cash cow is looking leaner this year, you don't have as much money for the other bets. And that leads us to our topic for, for the end of the show today, Justin, which is... Uh, where we are in we, uncharted waters, unprecedented. We've been saying yeah, it all yeah, the time, yeah, but yeah. we are in a situation where companies, large and small, are not able to do the things that they thought they would do. And this is really going to change the landscape of what technology gets developed and what technology ends up in your hands. Tom, let's say you own a restaurant. There is a difference between your air conditioner going out Maybe you got to not have people in for the weekend, right? And then, you know, the, the city in which your restaurant is in uh, being under a bloody coup where gunshots are ringing out into the streets. <laughs> right. Like, right now, what all these companies are realizing is that this is not a thing that will just be a 2020 thing. Uh, and more specifically, they don't know whether or not that will continue to be the case through this year through next year, through five years from now, or through 10 years from now. So for, for Deliv, I mean, if we're going to walk through all these individually, number one, Uber and Lyft, obviously the same boat. There is now far less demand for people to go from point A to B, period, right now in a state of lockdown. They don't know how much people are going to be excited to get into cars with strangers going forward at all, right? But they have to have at least in mind that it might be years before they get back to where they're going. I think that Uber is probably being a little bit more honest about uh, how bad this hurts, where Lyft seems to be hiding behind a bit of a crash diet in terms of how much uh, they've they've cut their staff, but they ultimately are dealing with the same scourge. Deliv, on the other hand, 
looks to me just like that that's a tech acquisition by Target. Target realizes that as they go forward, people coming into the store will be less than what it would be otherwise. They need their own Target will get you stuff solution and so that's there. But the most fascinating one is is Alphabet because like you mentioned, AdWords is in. AdWords has powered everything connected to Google. Every everything Anything that you might have thought, well, that might make no, it's AdWords. It's always AdWords. It's always been AdWords. Now, not only are we looking at a possible recession, if not depression, but also the value of those ads are are diminishing, much in the same way that uh, AdWords diminished uh, display advertising in print and stuff, uh, or or on television networks this now looks less reliable and that's terrifying for a company like Google. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's a lot of uh, anybody who tells you they know where this is going uh, is lying. This is not one of those stories we could say, well, the consensus is it's probably going to end up like this or, or we can probably guess what will happen is this because nobody knows. And no. that's, that's the, un, that's the, it's not terrifying, but that's the disconcerting part of all of this is everything you've gotten used to pre twenties, uh, is is no longer on the table. Uh, the the innovation coming out of small startups that then fold into bigger startups that then become products that you can buy that that is all getting disrupted and not disrupted by the innovators. It's getting disrupted despite what the innovators wants. So the question is, are we going to see what happened in 2007 where tech could innovate its way through it? Well, tech's getting hit where it hurts this time. It, it, tech wasn't funded by by mortgage-backed securities uh, yeah. in 2007. They're getting hit where it hurts with advertising. They're getting hit where it hurts with supply chain. They're getting hit where it hurts with demand. Not to mention just the fact that with this many people out of work, you just have a real problem with the economy having enough money circulating around to create demand for optional stuff like cell phones and, and wearables. And we're seeing like, well, it looks like smartwatches might be worth it because people are worried about health. Uh, so there are ways to go. Also in the past recession, we saw how people became entrepreneurs that didn't think they wanted to become entrepreneurs because they had to, because they were thrown out of work. Will that happen? Back then, there was a little more money kicking around. Uh, the economy came back pretty fast. Will it this time? I, the, these are the questions we have. This is not a segment we're going to tell you what happens. This is these are the questions you got to start looking for. These are the things you have to start thinking about. Yeah, th there's no doubt. Uh, uh, I think everybody here in uh, uh, the Bay Area is looking for a crystal ball and hoping that they could at least get a broad strokes on what the next five years is going to look like. Hey, thanks to everybody who participates in our subreddit. It's one of the ways we keep pulse on what you're interested in. So get in there, submit stories, and vote on them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. In the mailbag today, by the way, if you're like, where's Sarah Lane? Sarah Lane's got the day off. She'll be back. Don't worry. Uh, we got a great email from sometime contributor and friend of the show, Allison Sheridan, saying, not sure if this would qualify as something to offer the audience as what people are doing. We've been doing that sort of like sharing the love thing. But... Allison wanted to send this along in case it's helpful to you. She says, after hearing so much about the Apple Google exposure notification plan, I pictured my friends and family seeing a pop-up on their phones asking for permission and them not knowing what to do. I wrote a letter telling them to say yes and giving the briefest possible explanation of why. Then I gave a bit more depth and then an offer to go into excruciating detail if they emailed me. I wrote this as generically as possible so I could give it away for other people to modify and use for their own friends and families. I'm not asking anyone to agree with me that people should say yes, but if you do think they should say yes, maybe this will help. And we have a, a link in our show notes uh, to the folder that she has if you want to if you want to take a look at this this way to help explain what's going on with this uh, to your friends and family even if you don't want them to say yes necessarily you can probably pull some stuff out of here to just explain to them what it is and what's going on all right, folks, uh, shout out to our patrons at our master and grandmaster levels including John Johnston Chris Smith and Jeff Wilkes thank you all for supporting us 
And thank you, Justin Robert Young, for being here. Man, I was listening to uh, PX3 uh, today, and uh, I feel like I, I just have to call Andrew Heaton and tell him, like, yeah, me too. That's that is <laughs> my, my political journey as well. I, I It was one of the things I got out of today's show, but I always get a lot of really good stuff out of it. Yeah, it was a very interesting episode on Wednesday, mostly because I just I kind of felt the psychic connection that I had to call our friend Andrew Heaton, who does a great political podcast in his own right called The Political Orphanage, but... Uh, boy, howdy, did he need an opportunity to just yell. Uh, his show is very well written and manicured and clever. So this was a raw version of Andrew Heaton, uh, a pandemic crazy with a wild eye uh, talking about his frustrations in our current political climate, and specifically one that's been uh, exacerbated by uh, the, uh, the coronavirus. So I would encourage everybody to go check it out. Politics, politics, politics is the show. And of course, you can support this show at any level. Uh, we understand that more people than ever can't, and that's fine. That's why we have a public feed out there, and you you can support us that way, or or support us by leaving a review, uh, specifically in iTunes. Even if you're not an Apple user, uh, find a way in there and and leave leave some stars for us. That helps more people discover the show, which makes the show better. And of course, you can support us directly. That's always the best way. DailyTechNewsShow.com/slash/Patreon. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We're live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Patrick Norton and Len Peralta will be here as well. See you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>